Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining today's event, Introducing Poplar, the Future of Psychedelics Law and Regulation. Poplar is the project on psychedelics law and regulation, which we launched on June 30th. I'm Mason Marks. I'm a senior fellow and the project lead of Poplar. I'm also a law professor at the University of New Hampshire Franklin Pierce School of Law. The Petrie Farm Center is delighted to bring you this event with generous support from the SciSay Foundation. Before we get to the discussion, I'll mention a few housekeeping items. We welcome audience questions for our panelists, so please submit your questions. Throughout the event, I'll be pulling those questions to pose to our panelists. You may be wondering, how do I submit those questions? The best way is to use the Zoom Q&A feature. If you scroll to the bottom of your Zoom window, you'll see a small button marked Q&A. Just type your question there and I'll be checking that frequently. You're also welcome to submit your questions on Twitter using the hashtag Poplar. That's hashtag P-O-P-L-A-R. If you do submit a question there, Petrie Flom staff will be monitoring it and they'll pull it into the Zoom Q&A feature. Ways that you should not try to submit a question include the raise your hand feature on Zoom. We won't be using that today. We've also turned off the chat function so that our panelists can really focus in on the discussion. If you're interested in this event and others like it on health policy, bioethics, biotechnology, and related topics, we encourage you to sign up for the Petrie Flom Center newsletter and to read our blog, The Bill of Health, which features cutting edge commentary by legal scholars. I wanna thank the Poplar team, especially Laura Chong and Chloe Reichel, for making this event possible. Thank you also to Tim Ferris and Matt Mullenweg who support Poplar through the SISE Foundation. With that, let's launch into the symposium. In about 10 minutes, we'll welcome our keynote speaker, Rick Doblin, but first we have a very special guest to open the event. U.S. Congressman Earl Blumenauer was a vocal supporter of Oregon's historic Measure 109, which when approved by voters last November, legalized supervised administration of psilocybin in Oregon. He's also been an advocate for reforming federal cannabis laws, including by removing cannabis from the controlled substances list, regulating it, and pardoning federal cannabis related offenses. While there's a lot of misinformation out there about cannabis and psychedelics, Congressman Blumenauer has been a rational voice for evidence-based legal reforms. And that's what Poplar is about, educating, addressing misinformation, and supporting science-based psychedelics policies that promote equity and public health. So please join me in welcoming our guest, Congressman Earl Blumenauer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mason, for the kind introduction and for the work that you are doing. I'm really excited to have this conversation today and the launch of projects on psychedelics law and regulation, the popular research initiative. Uh, when you combine health, law, policy, biotechnology, and bioethics with the Harvard Law brand, this has the potential to have significant influence in this rapidly changing landscape. It's an area that I've been involved with throughout my public service, uh, starting in the 70s with the decriminalization of cannabis in Oregon. And I've continued to work to provide leadership on drug policy reform. I've enjoyed working uh, around the country from uh, Bangor, Maine to Santa Barbara. Uh, part of what gives me such hope is that this movement has not been driven by politicians. It is advocates, it's people in the industry, it's people who have been involved with aspects of medical cannabis for years. Um, I think I was the only politician that was involved with our psilocybin ballot measure 109 and, and an equally significant ballot measure 110 where uh, we have drug decriminalization and addiction treatment initiative. Um, we're a pretty blue state. But for reference, that initiative passed by a wider margin than Joe Biden's victory in Oregon. We have powerful examples, uh, particularly the impact of psilocybin that goes back decades uh, with the federal government's involvement. 
Uh, it's going to be fun to unpack uh, all of that uh, federal government engagement. But we need to move, we need more and better research, first and foremost. We need, need to move beyond the anecdotes that so many of us find compelling. And there are real life examples of people we know have experienced it, but it needs more scientific rigor. We need to fight the hypocrisy where the challenge psychedelics face as legitimate medical treatment, face the old obstacles to research, despite being less addictive and having fewer health risks than other drugs freely available. Nicotine and alcohol, for instance. The contrast with opioids is stunning. That epidemic has killed thousands, damaged millions of lives, seemingly with few meaningful controls. As I mentioned, I think our advantage is that the American public is ahead of the legislature and other policymakers. They are demonstrating their interest and their support, not just according to public opinion polls, but that support is very powerful on the ground. Uh, it's just as advocates are demanding an end to the dated and racist approach, it's responding to broad public support as witnessed by those election results. Here in Oregon, the voters were very busy last year, not just with the psilocybin therapy, a measured and controlled approach, but the ballot measure that essentially decriminalized hard drugs and invested much more significant resources from drug, for drug treatment here in Oregon using the increased revenues from our marijuana legalization. The measure to pass uh, the, the access to psilocybin established a framework and a law to allow for supervised administration of psilocybin assisted therapy throughout the state. I think this is a major equity issue. One of the challenges we've had with our failed war on drugs and its misapplication is how it's negatively impacted minorities and marginalized groups. The pandemic has revealed health disparities. We know the disparities in terms of the application of the law. Our psilocybin therapy will allow access to communities historically denied full access to traditional forms of medicine. This is especially important for low income communities of color, veterans, especially veterans who've tried and failed to receive relief, for example, of PTSD uh, from other forms of treatment. Many Oregonians feel they could benefit from psilocybin assisted therapy. It is an issue of equity. It's an issue of expanding the toolkit. It's expanding, responding to science and the public needs. I'm particularly interested in the potential to unlock revolutionary treatments on mood, anxiety, and substance abuse disorders. And this could not come at a more important time. The pandemic not only heightened the disparities in the treatment of healthcare, but it's had a dramatic impact on the mental and emotional health of Americans. Over two in five adults show symptoms of anxiety or depressive disorders. Here in Oregon, we've seen a major increase in overdose deaths. As we struggle to get through the COVID pandemic, we've got a mental health epidemic where it's clear our approaches have not been adequate. I hope our conversation today in the Poplar Center will help us address critical issues, ensuring equitable access for marginalized communities, and as I mentioned, especially veterans. We want to provide robust funding for additional therapeutic research. And I look forward to suggestions for removing red tape and bureaucratic redundancies for drug development and therapy that has dogged us as we work to rationalize our cannabis policies. And I want to stress that I think it's very, very important to respect traditional and sacred use of psychedelics by indigenous committees, communities. Native Americans must not be an afterthought. They have much to teach us, and we have much to respect in that tradition, which has been so abused uh, by the majority of American government. It's a, it's a tragic history. This is an important list of challenges. 
And I look forward to your conversation today, the work at the center, and for all of you helping us advance this cause. I promise you, I will do my part, not only assisting in the evolution of the Oregon program, but I plan on bringing this movement to Capitol Hill this year. The same way we developed a foundation for the support of our cannabis work, I want to and introduce the results of our work in Oregon and around the country. And I would like your center to be able to help raise awareness on Capitol Hill at this critical time in drug reform to help the federal government catch up to where the rest of America is. I think this is truly the opportunity of a lifeline. Uh, and I look forward to working with you to make it a reality. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Congressman, for your powerful remarks and for your leadership. We're very grateful for, for, you, um, for you joining us today. My pleasure. We will now um, welcome our keynote speaker, Rick Doblin. He's the founder and executive director of MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. He founded MAPS in 1986, shortly after the Drug Enforcement Administration added the psychedelic MDMA to Schedule One of the Controlled Substances list. Since then, he's been a leading voice in the destigmatization of MDMA and other psychedelic therapies, working closely with the Food and Drug Administration to make MDMA-assisted therapy an FDA-approved treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder. And thanks to his efforts and others at MAPS, that's nearly a reality. Rick is a graduate of Harvard's Kennedy School, and so it's a pleasure to welcome him home virtually to discuss his important work. Welcome, Rick Doblin. Uh, thank you very much, and, and thank you, Congressman Blumenauer. It was very inspiring to hear, hear your opening talk and to how you want to take this further. So um, it, it's just so exciting to, to be here with you today and to have this uh, topic being something that's being looked at in a careful way. So I'm going to talk about psychedelics from legal to illegal to medicines to legal again. Um, Stan Groff has talked about psychedelics are to the study of the mind, what the microscope is to biology and the telescope is to astronomy. Stan is the 90 years old now, uh, the leading LSD researcher. And we all know that the telescope at a time was very controversial. Galileo died under house arrest. Father Bruno, who espoused the uh, idea that the earth wasn't the center of the universe was burned at the stake by the church. So the telescope was extremely uh, controversial and dangerous for people to look at, look through, but now we just see it as a tool. And psychedelics are similarly tools and they're not good or bad in and of themselves, it's how they're used. And so we, we hope that the psychedelics will be seen in this destigmatized way as uh, really uh, essential tools for understanding who we are as humans and to healing all sorts of different issues. Um, this is the MAPS logo as interpreted by Alex Gray, uh, an artist. The important thing here is that the hands are first, the humans, it's about therapy. The psychedelic background is background and the human contact, the therapeutic use is the foreground. And so what we're talking about is psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Um, this is a picture of uh, Timothy Leary and me in 1990. This was a conversation at a uh, MAPS benefit. And I had just asked Tim, um, with all of his advice and all of his, his experience, you know, doing psychedelic research here at Harvard and also um, becoming a proponent, what advice did he have for me for trying to make psychedelics into medicines through the government? And his response was, fuck the government. I am so far past asking for permission for anything, but I'm glad you're doing it. And that's uh, where he held up my hand. So I felt like this was uh, not the passing the torch of cultural revolution, but passing the torch of sort of scientific research. And that was 1990. So if you look at this chart of the Web of Science, psychedelic publications, over about uh, 70 years, what you'll see is a peak in the the end of the 60s, early 70s, and that we all understand is the psychedelic revolution. And um, it was a major topic of scientific um, research. And the backlash happened, the Controlled Substances Act of 1970, and then things declined, scientific publications declined over the next 
uh, several decades. And almost all those papers were just about the risks of psychedelics. And then it started climbing again after 1990. And that's when the group of people at the FDA who regulate psychedelics took over and uh, switched to a new group who wanted to open the door to research, which they did in 1990 with Rick Strassman doing a DMT study, negatively focused on uh, schizophrenia, maybe DMT, the only endogenous psychedelic, um, maybe too much of it caused schizophrenia. Then 1992, the FDA formally opened the door to psychedelic research. And you can see since then that that's rippled all over the world. And now we are really in the midst of the renaissance of psychedelic research. So this was just two years after uh, Timothy Leary uh, spoke to me there at the conference. Um, initially, this was all done by nonprofits. Um, these are the sort of the main nonprofits. Um, then just um, a little bit around a year ago, uh, the first IPO for a for-profit psychedelic came about. And now there's a handful of psychedelic profit, nonprofits, but there's hundreds, we think over 400 um, for-profit psychedelic companies. This is just a list of some of them, many of them traded on the stock markets. And so I think there are really no fundamental regulatory obstacles at this point for doing psychedelic research and no fundamental financial obstacles um, as evidenced by um, all these for-profit companies. Since MAPS was founded in 86, we've raised over 130 million in donations and grants for psychedelic therapy and medical marijuana research. But in the last two years, the for-profits have raised about one and a half billion dollars. So that just gives you a sense of the scale of things. This is our corporate structure. MAPS is the nonprofit, which I started in April, uh, 1986. And the Public Benefit Corporation is our for-profit pharmaceutical arm, which we started December 2014. And this is sort of our virtuous circle. The Public Benefit Corporation is for-profit. We're trying to do two different things. One is bring back psychedelic-assisted therapy, but also market pharmaceuticals in a way that makes more sense than profit maximizing. And here, what we do is we maximize public benefit but the Public Benefit Corporation is 100% owned by the nonprofit. So people donate to MAPS, get a tax deduction, MAPS invests in the Public Benefit Corp. And then the Public Benefit Corp will do the research, will eventually sell MDMA, will make a profit, profits will be used for the mission of the nonprofit. So that's where our currently, whether we can go forward in this way or whether we'll need to take in investors or so to globalize, to commercialize, to reach sustainability is, is not clear yet, but this, this is our current corporate structure. And this is an important regulation that was passed actually 1984 called data exclusivity. And just to say what this is, is it's a different than a patent. And I think one of the problems we have, we're seeing is overbroad patents in, in psychedelics, but that's pro forma for pharma industry, but we wish it wouldn't be happening here. But Data exclusivity provides incentives for developing drugs that are off patent. And that means that no one can use your data for a period of five years. If you do pediatric studies, you get an extra six months and the FDA is requiring us to do pediatric studies. And then it blocks the generic competitor from applying for five and a half years. And then it takes FDA at least six months to review. So there's this period of data exclusivity to provide incentives for developing drugs like psilocybin, like MDMA, like Ibogaine, where the drugs themselves are in the public domain. Um, I didn't know about this till 2013. It's very obscure because uh, pharma companies don't develop drugs that they don't have patents on. So this data exclusivity is almost never used, but it is a law and it is providing us the opportunity to uh, tell donors, if you help us make MDMA into a medicine, then we can become a self-sustaining organization. And data exclusivity in Europe is 10 years, actually you know, eight years data exclusivity, two years market exclusivity. Um, now, our public benefit model, first off, going around the clock, we maximize therapeutic outcomes for each patient, not profit. We share our findings. We're not creating patents. We create an ethical practice model for the for-profit. So we're sympathetic with for-profit. We're supportive, but we um, want to kind of keep them in check. And we see the for-profit motive in our healthcare system has warped it beyond all sense. Um, we are very sympathetic with drug policy reform, and that's where I think we're different than a lot of for-profit companies. And I think what they do is they misunderstand their business model. They think that if people have legal access to psychedelics, um, either through the Oregon Psilocybin Initiative or just through decriminalization or eventually legalization, that that will be bad for their business model. 
especially if we introduce harm reduction, psychedelic peer support, honest drug education, pure drugs, to educate the people to be sort of both um, psychedelic informed about how to handle it, I think it's actually going to create more people who want to go to psychedelic clinics with trained professionals covered by insurance. But I think there is this concern among the for-profits that either is bad for the business model or that they should stay away from the controversy. But I think it's a moral imperative to see the uh, counterproductive nature of the drug war and to work on drug policy reform. We also obviously within that context support the use not just for medical purposes, but for personal and spiritual growth and also addressing conflict between couples. So couples therapy and cultures. We have a project where Israelis and Palestinians are using ayahuasca and MDMA together. And we're trying to study that as a model for psychedelics for a group conflict resolution. So this is our public benefit model. Um, to give you a sense, Sarko is a police officer from outside Boston. He's a psychotherapist and he's been given permission by his chief to go through our training program to learn how to give MDMA assisted therapy to other police officers with PTSD. Um, this was my TED talk. The NSA is advertising on my own, my TED talk. So um, we've reached a place of cultural acceptance and we're about to start research inside the Veterans Administration. I've been trying since 1990 to offer money to the VA to do MDMA PTSD research. And it's finally starting to happen at the Loma Linda VA sometime this month. And then shortly after Rachel Yehuda at the Bronx VA is gonna test two versus three sessions. Again, these are all funded by philanthropy, but they are taking place and it's a major turning point. So there's no obstacles anymore working at the VA. We, we've yet to enroll any active duty soldiers. That's what we're hoping to do soon. That's again, not a matter of regulation. We're going to start group therapy at the Portland VA uh, early next year. So we feel just very optimistic about the way things are going. Now, in terms of regulations, the, um, we've had a formal dispute resolution that cost us over a quarter million dollars of legal fees and many, many months with the FDA. But the FDA, we have a protocol to give MDMA to therapists as part of their training. And the FDA um, put a clinic, we have one that we're working on. We submitted a modified one. December 2019, and FDA put a clinical hold on it. And they said, no, too risky. There's no benefits from giving MDMA to therapists as part of their training. We're never going to give you permission for this. Give it up. Try something else to train them. Um, also, they wanted the lead facilitator of our two-person therapy team to be an MD or a PhD. Right now, they just have to be a licensed therapist. The second person doesn't need to have a license, but they um, wanted to insist that they have a bachelor's degree or 1,000 hours of behavioral health experience or in a program to get a license. And then they wanted there to be a physician on site for every psychedelic clinic, every psychedelic administration, where even for phase three, we don't have that. We have a physician doing prescribing, screening, and on call, but not on site. So these are poison pills. It took us it, for the, a lot of uh, therapists or local small private practice therapists. They don't, couldn't afford a doctor on site. So we went through a major, major process of this formal dispute resolution. And we appealed the division of psychiatry's views up to the Office of Neuroscience. And the Office of Neuroscience completely agreed with us. The clinical hold is removed. The lead person just needs to be a licensed therapist and the physician does not need to be on site. So this was um, regulation, not a law, but it was something that, again, the FDA is designed to permit these disputes to go to higher levels, which was terrific. And it's important to challenge the FDA because they're, they're nervous about approving stuff like this that's new and then getting blamed if anything goes wrong. So as far as our phase three results, just to, again, we've been permitted to move to phase three, final stage of research. Our first study was published uh, May 10th in Nature Medicine. The results were outstanding. We had two New York Times articles, psychedelic drug passes big test, um, psychedelic revolution is coming. This was on the front page of the New York Times, um, Scientific American, MDMA shows new promise for trauma, but the drug alone is not a cure. That's really the key point we're trying to make. And I'm glad that's getting across. It's not the drug, it's the therapy and the drug makes it. So what were the results? We had a very small p-value probability, meaning one in 10,000 chance that our results, the difference between the groups was due to a random factor rather than to the MDMA assisted therapy. We had a very large effect size. Point, effect sizes are on the basis of one, meaning one standard deviation. So the placebo subtracted effect size, we're basically, we're, our placebo is therapy. Therapy with inactive placebo versus therapy with MDMA. So the effect size of MDMA is, just, is 0.91. 
which is very large. The effect sizes for Zoloft and Paxil, which are approved for PTSD, the only drugs, are um, either some of their studies failed or they were small effect sizes or on the very low end of, of medium. But we're high and then very high. 2.1 effect size is the within subjects when you combine MDMA with therapy. It's enormous. We replicated results from phase two, no site to site variability. It wasn't driven by some uh, great therapist at a certain site. And we had an excellent safety profile, no increase in suicidality in the MDMA group. We did have two people attempt suicide. One person attempted suicide twice during the study. And one person had such severe suicidal ideation that she checked herself into a hospital to avoid killing herself. Both were in the placebo group. So we met all the criteria for FDA to approve a drug on the basis of one phase three study instead of two. Now, at the same time, a very similar time, FDA approves this Alzheimer's drug and it's can turn into a big scandal for FDA. They had failed phase three studies. They reinterpreted the data. It was marginal effect. It had significant safety problems. And yet it got approved. And we were rejected by the FDA on going forward with just one phase three study, even though we met all the criteria. So there is this concern about the controversy, the stigma of psychedelics. There's a concern about FDA uh, regulators not wanting to be criticized if something goes wrong. But um, again, this is not a matter of law. It's just these are judgment calls that the FDA made. And so we are going to have to go through to the second phase three study. This is a complicated slide, but just to show that um, the upper is the studies that we require for the NDA, which is new drug approval. Um, and so um, we anticipate the second phase three study in um, May of 2022, we'll get the interim analysis, uh, an early read how it's doing, and then it, it'll be done in October of 2022. And then we analyze the data. If it's good, we submit it to FDA. And then we think by the end of the third quarter, um, FDA will approve. And now DEA will reschedule 90 days later. Now, that used to be a problem. DEA would delay and delay and delay, and there was no way to force them. But Congress rectified that a bunch of years ago, and they passed a law that said that DEA must reschedule within 90 days. They didn't say which schedule it goes in, but DEA and the FDA Office of Controlled Substances Act work on that together. But DEA must reschedule. So this was a, a key um, regulatory um, problem that regulation, that law has changed. So now we can say for sure that uh, DEA must reschedule within 90 days. Now, states have to reschedule as well. And we will have a lot of work. 25 states automatically reschedule and the others you have to do various things with their Department of Public Health or whatever they call it, Commissioners of Public Health or Board of Pharmacies. So there will be a bunch of work once DEA and FDA approve and reschedule, then we um, have a lot of work to do on the states. And we hope it'll end up being in Schedule 3 or Schedule 4. I think that's likely. This is another matter of regulation. How is it going to be um, regulated post-approval. So it's called the Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategies, the REMS. It's only prescribed by prescribers certified in the REMS program. It means special education for prescribers. It's only going to be two to four hours about the health risks of MDMA. But the therapists who administer it only can be those that have been through our training program or our training program that we've licensed to schools of psychiatry and psychotherapy that has the content that we agree with. So only trained therapists and only special prescribers. And it's only shipped to the um, prescribers. It's never given to the patient. So it's never, it's not a take-home drug. It's only to be administered under direct supervision. And there's certain kind of safety screenings that are required. So under this kind of a situation, it's easy for the DEA to say that there's not going to be much drug diversion. Patients never get it to take home. It's only under supervision and it's only trained people. So I think that this is what we're going to negotiate with the FDA. Again, this is a matter of regulation, not law. There will be these psychotherapy clinics. The, there'll be eventually, I think, over 6,000 of them in America. Um, there's already over 1,000 ketamine clinics, so we hear. And also, these clinics, people are going to be want to cross-trained. The therapists want to be cross-trained in MDMA, psilocybin, ketamine, and whatever else gets approved. It's not going to be like, here's an MDMA clinic, here's a psilocybin clinic. So I think uh, this is what it's going to look like. Um, this is our goal for during this period of data exclusivity to deliver 1 million MDMA sessions um, 
and we hope we think it'll be on average maybe a two session model, half a million patients. And the bottom line here is the number of therapists that we need to train, and that's twenty five thousand therapists we're planning to train over the in the rest of the decade. And these numbers do not include group therapy, where that could dramatically increase what we're doing. And the, the tan line at the top is the, the therapist capacity. We're just assuming that they only work with psychedelics part of the time rather than all of the time. So they could potentially do more. And also we could uh, do more with group therapy, but there's eight or 9 million people with PTSD in America. So this is really only scratching the surface of the people that need the help but we do think it should only be used by trained therapists. Um, one of the biggest issues is going to be how do we fully train therapists? And the issue there is we think that therapists should have the legal opportunity to get the drug that they're gonna to give to patients, taking it themselves as a patient in a therapeutic setting. And how do we do that? We cannot knowingly sell as a sponsor for off-label uses. So MDMA for PTSD um, doesn't, inherently include giving MDMA to therapists as part of their training. And I said, we have protocols, but they're very expensive. We have to do all sorts of data gathering. So what we're gonna do is propose for the FDA label that the label will say MDMA for PTSD by trained therapist whose training can include one MDMA session. And if the FDA agrees to that, then that means that training therapist is on label and then we can do that without a protocol. And that's what I think we really need to do. You wouldn't go to a meditation teacher that didn't meditate, a yoga teacher that never did yoga, um, it makes sense for therapists who want to volunteer. We're never going to make this compulsory. It's always going to be um, voluntary. We don't think that every therapist who's done MDMA is better than every therapist who hasn't. It's just each therapist will be more effective themselves if they have um, you know, the experience with the drug that they're going to give to people. So this is how we approach it. Again, it's a matter of regulation. This is a really key, important argument. Legalization follows medicalization. So this is a chart over um, almost you know, more than 40 years about the American voter views, the Gallup chart on legalizing marijuana. Now the bottom is um, against the top or the, the bottom is for the top is against. And you can see it crosses over around 2013 where you get more than 50% um, are in favor of legalizing marijuana. Now notice here that there's a rise from the very beginning in 69 uh, through the 70s. This is when Jimmy Carter is elected in 76 on a platform of decriminalizing marijuana. But then you get the backlash, the parents' movements. Then you get Ronald Reagan just say no, starting in 1980. And support basically plateaus for several decades. And it only starts rising again around 1997. And what happened then? California and Arizona passed the first medical marijuana laws. So the rise of medical marijuana tracks the rise in uh, support for marijuana legalization. And I think that you get people believing or not sure what to believe about all this propaganda from uh, how terrible marijuana is, not to say that it doesn't, that it doesn't have risks, which it does. But I think medical use gives people um, access to stories of people that it's helpful for. It changes their risk benefit analysis. And also you see distribution models, the medical marijuana clinics that aren't surrounded by people with machine guns, it's not underground, and then you're making tax money. So this is our uh, history for marijuana. I think it'll be similar with MDMA. What we see here is, uh, you know, Denver made uh, mushrooms the first, uh, the lowest priority. They were the first one to do it, the lowest enforcement, Oakland followed, Oregon, uh, psilocybin initiative, so that we're seeing these things spread across America. Uh, then also Oregon decriminalizes all drugs, DC decriminalizes psychedelics. Um, and we are now, MAPS is doing psychedelic harm reduction as part of our mission to make drug policy reform work. So we are consulting with and have a training program for police uh, in Denver about what to do if they see somebody having a difficult psychedelic experience. And we're gonna do a pilot of about a hundred. If that works, we're gonna sign a contract uh, to do around 3000 first responders in Denver. And we hope to do that in Oregon and elsewhere to really build in our first responders an understanding of, of a better way to respond. So we've been doing this at festivals all over the world, particularly Burning Man and Boom Festival. And we're developing this public health framework for a post-prohibition future. It's just a nice little slide. 
Um, we've done it at these festivals, but we're also trying to, as I say, do it with the uh, Denver police and others. Um, the way that we're thinking that this will work is that there will be licensed legalization. This is the long-term goal, that people have a license to do drugs. And the thing is that if you misbehave, your license is taken away and you get punished for your misbehavior. You don't get punished for your um, state of consciousness. It's your behavior. It's your performance. And the reason why I'm talking about this is that um, drunk drivers can lose their driver's license, but they easily can go to a bar and buy more uh, alcohol, get in their car and kill people. We need to make it harder for people to, if they're drunk drivers, harder for them to get the alcohol too. So I think we regulate alcohol too lightly. This is the program that we're talking about in the future for licensed legalization. We think it's gonna require a decade of these psychedelic clinics being rolled out for people to hear these stories from people with um, positive experiences and also to see psychedelic clinics, again, emerging from the underground. And that will change people's mind. We'll have licensed legalization, I think, in 2035. Now, how do we handle kids? For alcohol, 23 states where alcohol is uh, prohibited to minors have an override for parents, where parents can give um, alcohol to their kids. And I think that's the way it should be with psychedelics, that uh, there should be a parental override. And if you look at the cultures that have successfully integrated psychedelics, like the Navajo uh, Native Americans that... Um, Congressman Blumenauer mentioned, or um, <clears throat> the ayahuasca churches, they don't have these age limits. So we're the, um, the parents, we, we are the family values. And we think that this decision should be made by the families rather than by the government. Um, Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut said, when we see our fundamental unity with the processes of nature and the functioning of the universe, as I so vividly saw it from the Apollo spacecraft, the old ways of thinking and behaving would disappear. So this fundamental unity is what people can experience through psychedelics. And I think that will have profound political implications once we realize our intimate connection to nature, to global warming, to the environment, to other species, to other people who look differently than us or have different religions, different races, different gender orientations. I think this fundamental unity, psychedelics will help people experience this. This is why we need mass mental health is our goal. We need drug policy reform and we also need drug development. It's a lot easier to work with psychedelics than shoot everybody up in space. So this is the political theory behind what we're trying to say is the more people we can help experience this fundamental unity, the better off we'll be. And then we hope 2070 psychedelic utopia, this was, you know, that we'll have a more spiritualized world. Right now we're humans as a group, lemmings going over the cliff, it's what we're doing with the environment and um, warfare and prejudice and authoritarianism. So this is our sort of idealistic plan. Now, how did this begin? Just to say MDMA was invented in 1912. Um, it was rediscovered by Sasha Shulgin. Uh, it was introduced into therapy by Leo Zeff, the secret chief. It leaked out of this to become ecstasy, and that's what attracted the government's attention. They started criminalizing. This is me in the background going in to uh, ask for a hearing in 1984. We won the hearing. The judge said MDMA should be a um, Schedule Three drug, but the DEA rejected the recommendation. They criminalized MDMA on an emergency basis while the hearing was still going on. That was illegal. They didn't have the authority to do that. People got busted for the first year, got released. And then I started MAPS. And I realized the only way was gonna be nonprofit drug development through the FDA. And our first um, protocols from Harvard, from elsewhere were all rejected. And then it was 1992 that Charlie Grove and I got permission for the first phase one dose response safety study. Um, this now points to the FDA again as being the key factor. And it wasn't regulation. It wasn't laws. It, it was people interpreted differently the data that they saw at the FDA and they decided to let the research go forward. This is a psychedelic slide paired by the FDA just to indicate again that they're fully behind this. Um, but we don't have federal funding. So the Texas legislature has allocated 1.5 million to the Houston VA to study psilocybin. And we're working with them now to um, allocate another 1.4 million or 1.5 million for an MDMA arm to compare with psilocybin. So we'll know in the next month or so if they allocate that money. Um, Dan Crenshaw, this is bipartisan support. He's a, a Republican congressman from Texas, from Houston, former Navy SEAL. He's our main ally. He's heard from so many Navy SEALs who've gotten help from psychedelics. He uh, put this amendment to the Defense Appropriations uh, Act to help the DOD do this. It didn't get attached, but it's starting to show that we're doing some work. This is where we need help, federal funding. Um, 
Matt Johnson just announced at uh, Hopkins that for the first time in half a, over half a century, NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, has given a grant of $4 million over three years to study psilocybin for smoking cessation. So finally, NIDA is getting over its prejudices against saying anything good about illegal drugs. Now, the last thing that has been really uh, bad about um, regulations and, and potentially, uh, you know, legal obstruction of Schedule One research was with marijuana. And it was through the NIDA monopoly, which has been existent since 1968. There's only been one source of marijuana for FDA regulated research, but it's only for research, not for commercial use. And so therefore in phase three FDA studies, you have to use the exact same drug that would be commercialized. And since you can't commercialize NIDA marijuana, this is how we blocked, the, how the DEA blocked marijuana from becoming a medicine. Now we, by the FDA, we have all these states but they've done that as a reaction in part against the fact that the federal system was blocked. NIDA also provides terrible quality marijuana, the oldest, the driest, it's really bad. Um, I've been um, involved with lawsuits against the DEA trying to break this monopoly since 2000. The, we finally got into court in 2005. Again, we won the case and the DEA once again rejected the recommendation and kept, uh, rejected, kept the NIDA monopoly. But that just ended... Um, a few months ago, the DEA finally is going to license other people to grow marijuana so that there can be drug development um, in the United States with domestic product. Uh, this, um, and you can see the contrast we're trying to make between good quality marijuana and what NIDA provides. And also, uh, we just got 12.9 million from the state of Michigan for a study of uh, cannabis in uh, veterans with PTSD and 320 veterans. So. We're getting state funding, not federal funding. There now that this monopoly has ended, there are really no fundamental um, political obstructions to research with psychedelics or marijuana. And as uh, closing, I'll just say that this is going to be another area of research uh, or, or regulatory that we'll have to deal with is direct to consumer ads. So this we've kind of created as a fun thing. You know, ask your doctor if MDMA therapy is right for you. You know, how do we handle really direct to consumer ads? You know all sorts of issues related to that. And so um, I just wanna say that it's been a real pleasure to uh, be able to give this big overview to all of you. And also to say that I feel that we are in an incredible moment of opportunity of great need and open doors at the regulatory agencies, not just in the US, but around the world. And I think if we're very careful and very thoughtful and do a lot of public education, and a lot of pre-thought about laws and regulations that we will be able to mainstream psychedelics and potentially have a big impact on the mass mental health. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was such an interesting, incredibly rich presentation. And um, we have a, a, a number of questions. I just wanna ask you one um, that I think is, is really important. This comes from Brendan Aronson. How can entrepreneurs and advocates help veterans gain access to this medicine? Are there any unmet needs right yeah. now? How can people help? Well, for example, um, we need uh, outside funding. The VA is not yet at the point where they're willing to fund it. So we've got the Texas state legislature for if there are entrepreneurs in Texas, they can work now with the Texas legislature with their representatives to try to get them to allocate this 1.4 million um, to do an MDMA comparison to psilocybin. Also, um, wherever you happen to be located, contact your local VA and suggest that they get involved in this. There's a, a program called, a, a, a program of therapy, cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy, which is conjoint as couples or dyads where one has PTSD and the other is impacted, the, the partner is impacted. And we've done a small treatment development study where both of them get MDMA. And the results were better than anything with cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy without MDMA. And it's an accepted evidence-based treatment used throughout the VA. So we're trying to raise uh, $2 million to start studies inside the VA. So right now, entrepreneurs can engage the VA. They can donate to MAPS to, to help us do this, contact their representatives, and just say that um, we really need this. But I'd say that the critical thing is moving us into the Department of Defense to active duty soldiers. On the theme of treating people closer to the trauma, the closer to the trauma, the easier it is. And that's the same idea of doing pediatric studies. So the FDA has said, if we succeed in adults, we have to study 12 to 17 year olds. So I think um, 
we need help to really get approval from people in the DOD to let active duty soldiers with PTSD go through our treatment. Thanks again for joining us. It's really been a pleasure having you. And thanks also to Congressman Blumenauer. And this is